So today we will be discussing insect mouth parts. And I'm also just going to review a little bit of basic entomology stuff for those who are not uh, entomologists. So let's first go over arthropods. Arthropod is a phylum. Arthropoda. What are the characteristics of arthropods? Segmented body formation. Oh, because I asked him this, I think maybe on his... No, it's because I'm the TA for general entomology. Okay, so segmented body, did you say? Yes. I did have that. What else? Anybody else? Invertebrates. Invertebrates. So the no backbone. What else? This will be on the test. They molt. They molt. I I think that yeah yes like that is, um, but this this confuses me and I'll tell you I'll t I'll talk about why. But I originally do think that too that that should be sort of like a characteristic. There's other organisms that are not arthropods that also molt. That's why that's kind of confusing. But all the arthropods molt. That's true. Is jointed appendage as well? Yes. Jointed. So like legs, antennas, appendages. Uh, miss, there's one we're missing that's obvious. Antenna? No. Six legs. No? We'll go over that in a sec though. Exoskeleton? Yes. Oh. Exoskeleton. So I got in trouble with this one because I got into the habit of thinking that arthropods are things that molt. Guess what also molts that's not an arthropod? Nematodes. Nematodes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I always like got confused and I was like, aren't nematodes arthropods? And there were a couple like really embarrassing scenarios where like I'm an entomology expert and I'm not aware that nematodes are uh, not arthropods. They're in their own phylum, nematoda. But all arthropods do molt, but just be careful about this one. Um, also, um, nematodes are also segmented bodies that are also invertebrates. They also have, well, they don't, I don't know if you, they do have a cuticle. I don't know if you'd call that an exoskeleton, but they don't, certainly don't have jointed appendages. So I think this is definitely like one of the important ones you're like, ah, that's an arthropod. Okay. Um, we'll cover that after this. Let's now talk about hexapoda. So you said six legs. That's a subphylum. Because guess what is also an arthropod but does not have six legs? Spiders. Spiders. There's other important ones. Mites. Mites. Ticks, scorpions. So, um, hexapoda, people technically think refers to what we call insects, although it's a little bit more complicated than that. So, underneath hexapoda, there's a few there's a few different things. One of which is insecta, which is I think a class. Okay. And the point is, is insecta is actually not, not defined only by the six legs um, because there's other things out here outside of insecta that are within hexapoda. Do my entomologists know what they are? Yes. They are, what are they? He wasn't put ready to put on the spot. What? Three you said yes. Scorpiones? What? I'm just naming families. Oh, I thought you said yes. What, what did you say, Nat? Uh, three body parts, so like head, no, like what are, what are other organisms that are hexapods but are not insects? Um. Entomologist? Maybe? Yes? No? Really? Centipedes? They are arthropods, but they're not uh they're not hexapoda because they have way more than six legs. Oh. So everything in hexapoda has six legs. Is this like a this may be like a huge just like crap. This is actually like a thesis question for entomology like graduate students, like what is the definition of insecta and how is it different from other things that have six legs? Like is beetles. Like huh? Beetles? Beetles are within are insecta. Like the wingless, wingless like insects, like columbula? Yes, but okay. that they're not, but there are other wingless insects. Right. Like that's not why they're outside. But yes, that's the right. So there's columbula. Col columbula. Uh, these are like the springtails. They like have a little um, 
So it's like a little lever that's like a tail. Hexapods. What? Wingless hexapods. Well, they are wingless, but they're not outside of Insecta because they're wingless. That's not why. They're out of ins they're outside of Insecta because actually what defines what is an insect is actually the mouth parts. So it's called ecto like the um, streblings. Hang on, hang on, hang on. We're all we're all like we're we're going everywhere. Let, let me just explain. So insects have external mouth parts. That's actually like a defining characteristic of them. Ectognatha. Natha is mouth parts, something like that. Ecto is like outside. These ones, guess what they are? Internal. Yeah, it's internal mouth parts. It's entognatha. So the point of this is just to sort of get you oriented around sort of the things that we're talking about or going to be talking about a lot. They're pretty much mostly all within arthropoda. So they're segmented invertebrates that molt, that have jointed appendages and exoskeletons. And some of these things that we're gonna be talking about are not insects, like spiders, mites, ticks, scorpions. And then as a class underneath arthropoda, there are insects and they're actually, they're six-legged things, but they're not the only six-legged things and they're not defined necessarily by their wings because there's many insects that don't have wings, but they are defined by having external mouth parts. And then there's other six-legged things like columba, which are very close to insects, but they're different in that their mouth parts are internal. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. And this is for, again, for my entomologist, this is actually like a pretty common thesis question is like, what makes, a, what makes an insect an insect? Um, yeah, let me just make sure I didn't miss anything. So within this, within this, just other characteristics, definitely anything in hexapoda has six legs, six legs. Um, insects have antennae, and I'm always gonna spell this wrong. It's something like that. Uh, they have compound eyes. So they have eyes. And often they have wings, but not always. There are insects that um, are insect, they became insects and then wings are a later evolution. So there are some insects that just never evolved wings. And then there are other insects that had wings before and then lost them. So just keep that in mind. Wings is not necessarily like a defining characteristic. Um, did I miss anything? No. Okay. Got it? Good. I'll probably put something like this on the test. Okay. Other things, this should be easy. Much of this is going to be a little bit of review, but just in case, uh, holo metaboli versus hemi metaboli. What are, what are these things? What's this? Everybody should know what this is kind of from basic biology, but maybe you haven't heard it in this word. What's the other common colloquial word for holo metaboli? Really? My insect people? If it has the same as the uh, egg larvae being put on. Yeah, what's that called? Metamorphosis. Yes. So there, there are two, there's a, there's, so the insects divide. There's a split within Insecta where metamorphosis evolved. And so there's a split, a phylogenetic split where insects on one side are hemimetabolous and insects on the other side are holometabolous. Okay. And it's like, it happened once. Holometaboli evolved once. And so there's a split. Holometaboli is metamorphosis. That means they have eggs and then larvae, larvae and then pupae and then some adult phase. And it's sort of like a, um, you see pretty consistent themes. Like the job of the larvae is always to do what? Eat. It just eats. That's pretty much the job of the larvae. Is like it eats, it gathers energy for metamorphosis, and then the pupae hits, and what happens during the pupal stage? 
accumulate when it metamorphosizes? It forms some kind of like a cocoon, not necessarily always like a cocoon structure, but it forms like some kind of a weird like thing that inside what's happening is a whole bunch of structural changes are happening. And then for example, like mosquitoes, mosquitoes, uh, these two life stages are aquatic. And then, in the, and then there's a huge rearrangement of the structure. And then all of a sudden the adult is like totally different. And the adult's job is, guess what? What? Yeah, it like mates. That's essentially like its job. So that's the gist of holometabolous insects. Hemimetabolous insects do not go through a pupal stage. So they essentially like, they have eggs. And then what comes out of the egg is called a nymph. Okay. And the nymph is essentially like a little bug. It's like, a, it looks exactly like the adult, except it's smaller. So if you see, um, silverfish. yeah, silverfish do that. All those, are silverfish insects? Hemipterans. Yeah, like hemipterans is the one I always think of. Hemipterans are like true bugs. So in our case, the one that we'll be working with or thinking about is kissing bugs. Um, essentially like something that looks like this. Like what comes out of the egg is just a tiny form that looks like this. And then it progressively just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger through molds and then it reaches the adult stage. So essentially, essentially hemimetaboly is, you have an egg, it hatches into a nymph, and then you go through a few stages and then you hit an adult. So there's no metamorphosis. That's the key understanding here. Any questions? Good. Okay. So just basic review of sort of like basic insect biological stuff. Okay. So we have learned that um, insecta is actually one of the important th defining features is these external mouth parts. So let's describe some of the mouth parts. Where are they? So we should also know anterior, posterior. I actually like bringing this up because it's just kind of like an, an interesting like evolutionary question. How come the mouth parts are anterior? Like why, why evolve mouth parts on the anterior side of the organism? So like in organisms, there's typically like a head and then there's like a butt, however you want to like arrange it. Why do mouth parts, why are mouth parts like always in the head? Isn't that just like the start of the imagination? Like that's just the start of the No, they could, I mean, you could evolve mouth parts anywhere you want it. You could put mouth parts here, you could put mouth parts here, you could put mouth parts in the butt. Like, why Why evolve mouth parts in the head? It's because that's the direction they go. Yes, that's the evolutionary pressure that selects for mouth parts to evolve in the head, is the head is like where it's going. And guess where you're always going? You're always going towards like food. So that's why mouth parts evolve in the head, okay? So the other interesting thing about insects um, is as they, as they um, develop, they're segmented organisms. And if you learn about insect development, like pretty much what happens is you get this, you get this thing, and then there's an invagination step, which is called gastrulation. You don't need to know that right now for this course. But then like a second step or a later step in development is you define these like segments. And then it sort of makes the program of developing the organism easier if everything here can just sort of focus on like what this segment does or what this segment does or what this segment does. It's sort of like, it's almost like it, um, like it's like an organizational principle um, that it first divides itself into segments, okay? And so the head, the head is actually like a fusion of multiple segments. So the head is a fusion of what's called somites. So this is kind of an important word. Somites are like the segments, or if you see an insect body, there'll be these like plates of the exoskeleton. Those are like the somites. So the head is a fusion of somites. And one interesting feature about development is there's these genes called Hox genes. And the Hox genes like turn on features in certain segments. So in segments that are gonna be on the thorax, okay, that's another good thing that is it, that defines, that I did not say. Uh, that defines insects is head, 
thorax, abdomen. So people who are watching this online are probably gonna be like, oh my God, you didn't even say that. Uh, but this is also another thing of insects, head, thorax, abdomen. So what kind of things pop up on the thorax? Let's say these segments are gonna be thorax segments. What kind of things pop up? Limbs. 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 So you get legs, you get wings, you get, if it's a fly, you get haltiers. Otherwise, the normal case of flying insects is you have double wings. Um, so depending on what you are, like there's Hox genes that turn on certain features on certain segments. Like if this segment is a thorax segment, it'll say, put on a leg here. Or if this, and if it's, this is one segment that's gonna have the wing, it'll say, turn on a wing here. And that's kind of literally like how it happens. Uh, it's like programmed into the segmentation. So with this understood, this gives you a really interesting perspective on the insect mouth parts. So knowing that a head is a fusion of these segments, these somites, so it's essentially like if you have like a head, it's like a fusion of segments. And Hox genes will like turn on essentially what like I have this term, I just, it's like called face legs. That's kind of like what I say, like that's kind of what's happening when insects program their head uh, appendages. They're literally appendages. Appendages. And that's one of the defining characteristics, right? The segmented appendages. And uh, if you actually look at mouth parts, they look like legs. Like it's literally like turning on like a little leg program on little fused parts of the head and they get these little face-like legs. They're, they're evolutionary like different, like they've evolved so that they're no longer legs, but they look like legs. And so I will explain that in a second. So the key words here to remember, Hox genes, head, thorax, abdomen, the nath, there's a term called the nathocephalon. I think cephalon is head and natho is fusion or something. I saw it's, maybe it's reciprocal or something like that. This is essentially the nathocephalon is this, this idea that the somites fuse to form the head, okay? Uh, anterior, posterior. Those are the other keywords. I, when I teach, I'm very much sort of like a keyword kind of guy, like know these keywords, and then I ask questions on the test about like keywords. So I'll try to point those out. Okay. Um, okay, so let's, let's describe some of these mouth parts. What, what's my time at? Okay, so let me know when it's getting closer. So there's kind of like what you might call, I guess, stereotypical, like boilerplate mouth parts that are sort of like the ancestral mouth parts, like what all sort of basic insect mouth parts look like. Okay, and I will describe those. So there's five sort of like pieces that you're gonna need to remember. Okay, you can remember it through various ways. And I'll go through the various ways of how to, or how to remember this. There's mandibles, and I'll try to like draw these out. Mandibles look like this, and they go, like this, like they just go, ch, ch, ch. they're literally like there's a hinge, there's a hinge here, and they kind of just like go, rink, rink, rink. those are mandibles. Okay, so know the mandibles, these are typically for chewing. Okay, there are maxillary, make sure I spell it right, maxillary palps, okay, and these are essentially like underneath. And they are literally like legs. Like they have like appendaged legs, like this. Okay. And the thing about insect appendages is every other appendage is an alternating uh, hinge. So if this hinge only goes like this, say like hinge one only goes up and down, second hinge goes left and right and then the next hinge goes up and down, and then the second hinge goes left and right. And through these sort of like different movements, like if you built a robot, it, you can have a huge range of motion by encoding up and down, left and right, up and down, left and right, etc. That's how the 
That's how the appendages of insects work in general. Okay, and then you have typically labial palps. Yeah. These are pretty much like, you know, like you have some kind of like appendages coming out like this. Okay. And you know, like they have, they can articulate very similar to the maxillary palps. Okay. And then you have uh, labrum, which is the upper lip. That's typically like up here. It's like a lip. That sort of like stuff gets like shoved in underneath the labrum. Okay. And then there's a labium, which is, guess what the labium is? It's essentially like the lower lip. So this is like the stereotypical um, mouth parts of an insect. And I would kind of expect you to know these things and I would kind of expect you to be able to like draw out like a basic insect mouth, which is this, okay? This is actually like really hard to memorize because the labial palps and the labrum and the labium are all like L words and the maxillary palps and the mandibles are all M words. So like even me as a PhD in entomology, I'm always like, it's like really hard to memorize this. Um, but I do memorize specific mouth parts for specific insects. And this is, again, this is the common theme. So you want to know this. Okay, and maybe, maybe it helps if you sort of, like sometimes I'm a visual thinker, maybe if you just remember like the order in which you write them is like the order of how they're organized. So like labrum is at the top, and then you have the mandibles, and then you have the, you have the mandibles, and then underneath are the maxillary palps, and then you have the labium slash labial palps. Okay, if you just kind of like visually remember this, like there's a sandwich of the M's flanked by the L's, Maybe that will help you, maybe it won't, maybe that'll make it more confusing. But that's kind of like, maybe that will help. Good? Okay, so I actually think this is really cool. Like, this is really interesting. Um, it gets even more interesting now. So now, like, if you think about how insects spread disease, this is why I have this lecture in this class, is how insects spread disease is directly related to essentially, like, the structure of their mouth parts. So all the different insects or arthropods that spread disease, they have sort of subtle variations of their mouth parts that have evolved in different ways and that directly affects how they spread diseases. So we'll now kind of like go over um, how they spread disease. Although I don't wanna, I don't wanna erase this yet. So I'm gonna try to, there we go. Come over here, okay. Um, Before we talk about the evolutions, let's note that these are insect mouth parts, they are not spider mouth parts, okay? So spiders and ticks are within chelicerata, or you call them chelicerids, okay? And they are also defined by the structures of their mouth parts. Theirs are a lot easier to draw. It's essentially like two like big things, which are called chelicerae, chelicerae. And like, if you have a spider, like here's where they have fangs. And it's essentially just like two lobes. Like you will see these two lobes in ticks, in mites, and in spiders, okay? So again, keep in mind that the chelicerates, which are also important medically and veterinarily, are different from the insect mouth parts. These are much easier to remember. Okay. So, um, okay, let's talk about evolved mouth parts. Okay. So you mentioned Daniel. Last time you mentioned tabanids, and now I want to talk about those. Tabanids are what? Flies. What kind of flies? Uh, or what? What's the colloquial name? The common name? Uh, horse flies. Yeah, horse flies and deer flies. 
Good. Horse flies, deer flies. Okay, and let me ask you a question. Does it hurt more to get bit by a horse fly or a deer fly or a mosquito? It hurts way more. It hurts way more to get bit by tobannins, and that is because of the evolution of their mouth parts. Okay, so I'm gonna try to I'm gonna try to draw this out. Something. If you were to if you were to take so their head kind of looks like this. It's literally like okay something like this, and if you were to take this and cross section it, like cut it in half and then look from the top, it essentially looks. Something like this, okay. And essentially what this is, is hopefully I get this right, yes. The labia, so the lower lip, in many of the flies, the lower lip has, or many of the biting flies, the lower lip has sort of evolved. It's like, it's like spread out and it's sort of like covering <laughs> these sort of like sharp needles, okay? Um, oftentimes you'll see the word stylets. You'll see stylets in mosquito mark parts or in tabanids. The, the interesting thing about the tabanids is these are like the, the, so the maxillary, let's see what's at the top, the man, there's the mandibles and the maxillary palps. They are evolved and changed, so they don't have mandibles anymore, and they don't have appendages anymore, but they've essentially evolved into like sharp knives. They're literally like knives. And guess what they do? They like go rink, 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 and they like slice your skin, and that causes your blood to pool, and then they suck that up through, if I get this right, there's always a, a hypopharynx which is some kind of like a tube. Um, but I don't want to say they suck it up through a hypopharynx because in the mosquito, the hypopharynx is the spit tube. But essentially like what happens in the, these are called telmophages. And this is a key word. This will be on the test, the telmophages. That's a strategy of feeding where you develop, you evolve razor blades and you slash the skin that causes the blood to pool and then you suck it up, okay? So this will be a keyword that will be on the test. You gotta remember that this is a feeding strategy that evolves, it's very common in flies. They slash the skin, blood pools, they suck it up. And essentially the evolution is the labium is starting to surround the stylets and these, they literally are like the maxillary and the mandibles, they're literally like sharp razors. That's what they look like. Um, and there's cool pictures online, like if you just Google telmophage, is it gonna be better than my drawing? But I actually think it's a good activity to try to draw them yourself, because it forces you to be able to organize it in your mind. Okay, so that's the telmophages. Not to be confused with what are, what are mosquitoes? Does anybody know? Not to be confused with the selenophages, which is also a keyword. The example here are the mosquitoes. Mosquitoes, okay. And let's see if I can do this. Although I have a key cheat sheet. <laughs> I did have to do this for my PhD exam. Uh, so, uh, okay. So let's draw some mosquito mouth parts. So a mosquito, how does a mosquito mouth part look that's different from telmophages? It's like a sword in a sheath. Yes, it's a, but it's a very, very fine sword. It's more like a rapier, yeah, like, yeah. A, like a poker, not like a broadsword. These I would describe as more, if we're gonna get into like funky, like D&D &D analogies, the telmophages is more like a broadsword. These are like a, like a rapier, like a fine uh, sword. Um, okay, so let's draw them out. So if you see a mosquito and you look at its mouth part, you'll see something like this. You won't actually see the mouth parts. And this is the lay, oh God, let me get this right. It's the lay, oh God. It's the labium, it's the labium. And that makes sense because it's the lower lip. 
And in mosquitoes, it's fully evolved. Like now it's stretched all the way around. So when you cross section the telmophages, it's like kind of starting to be around. When you cross section the labium of the mosquito, it's like totally evolved wrapped around. So this is like a sheath. Think like you pull a sword out of your sheath. Like it's literally like a sheath, okay? So when you see a mosquito mouth part, you're not actually seeing what it bites you with. You're seeing the sheath, okay? And when a mosquito bites, the sheath retracts. And you'll see, if you actually look at a mosquito when it's biting, you'll see something that looks like this. This is the labium retracting and unleashing like the stylus, okay? So you'll actually see this when a mosquito is feeding. So the labium, which is the sheath, retracts. Okay, once it retracts, what is underneath is a tube, which is the upper lip, which is the labrum. So the upper lip has evolved into a tube, okay? It's essentially, this is literally the needle. This is the needle that the mosquito sucks up blood. Okay, and that's not the only thing you'll see. You will see, I'm drawing them squiggly because they're very flexible and they're very bendable and they're very sharp. These are the, get the order right here, the mandibles, MD, and the maxillary stylets. This is the case they're called stylets, so it's the mandibular stylets and the maxillary stylets. They're a little bit different, but they're pretty much the same thing. The, this is the important thing to remember. The, it's actually easier to remember if you see the X, we just visually look at the X. The maxillaries are serrated. So if you actually zoom in with like a, um, a very sharp microscope, you will see serrated blades on the tip of the maxillary style. So guess what they do? They help make the hole. How do they help make the hole? Yeah, so when a mosquito feeds, the head like vibrates, the maxillary stylets vibrate, and it's actually like at a set frequency and they're sawing. They're literally like sawing the skin. And the reason that they saw is that because it reduces the force that's needed to put the labrum into your skin. So the reason you don't feel a mosquito typically when it bites you, unless you're looking at it, then you can feel it. But if you don't notice it, it's because there's this sort of like subtle sawing and that sort of like eases the friction through which the labrum can insert, okay? There's one more tube that you need to remember, which is sits on top, it's, it's hard to draw, I'll get it with a different color. It sits on top of the labrum. This is called the hypopharynx. And this is a very important point, okay? The hypopharynx is what delivers the spit. So when people, people have a misinterpretation of what mosquitoes are, they think they're spreading diseases by the mechanism of mechanical transmission like a dirty needle. Like if you are, if you are like taking injectable drugs and you get AIDS or something like that, that's because somebody got that, they injected themselves, they got that thing on the, they got that disease or pathogen on the tip of that needle and then you injected yourself and you got that disease through like physical contact. That is not how mosquitoes spread disease, okay? There are two tubes, two tubes, okay? And if a mosquito bites you, it sucks up blood through the labrum, so the blood goes up through the labrum and it's not a, it's only a one-way tube it goes straight up okay and then it spits out saliva through the hypopharynx so the only way you will get a disease from a mosquito when it bites you is if there is pathogen in the saliva and it's spitting it out there's an exception of filarial worms filarial worms aren't necessarily like in the saliva they're they like infest the they like grow in the we call this the mouth parts. So that, that might be one exception. But in general, like viruses, malaria, um, things like that, that's why they have to get to the salivary glands for them to transmit the disease to you is because it has to come out through the spit. 
So the key things to remember, the two tubes, and remember the basic structure and what they do, like the maxillary stylets saw the skin, the mandible stylets are just sort of like similar to the maxillary stylets, but they're not serrated. The labrum sucks up the blood, the hypopharynx spits out. Uh, a final point about the maxillary stylets, they are essential. Mosquitoes cannot feed if they don't have them. How would you do the experiment to prove that? You cut them off. So there's a famous paper, I think it's actually attached, that is like a one page nature paper where the first people were like, let's prove that the maxillary stylets are essential. And they just cut them off of the mosquito and then saw if the mosquito could feed and it could not. And that proved that the sort of like sawing uh, function is essential for feeding. So they can't feed without that function. Those are the solanophages. Any questions? All those structures are called maxillary Oh, okay, so, so, so the maxillary stylets, let me, not all these structures are called maxillary stylets. The labrum is not a stylet. You would call that uh, a needle, I guess. The mandibles are stylets, and then there's maxillary stylets. So these things, the mandibles, have essentially changed in, through evolution to very sharp, flexible needles. Mm -hmm. And the maxillary palps, ditto, have also evolved into very sharp, but this time serrated, stylus. So stylet is kind of what, what you think of like, um, again, like a very fine, very thin type of like, kind of like sword or needle. But that's in contrast to the labrum, which is much thicker. It's kind of thick. And that's what sucks up. Um, you could consider the hypopharynx a stylet because it's very flexible. A couple other things about the mouth parts is these can bend at 90 degree angles. So like if you watch a mosquito, there, there are videos on YouTube of mosquitoes feeding. It's worth like looking up and looking at. They will like their mouth parts will like go like that. And they have nerves, they can taste, they can sense. And when they're going in, they are bending and searching for a capillary. So what they're doing when they bite you is they're first just getting the stylets in and then they are literally like squiggling them around until they find a capillary, they taste that, and then they will insert into the capillary and then they will get the labrum in that spot. So this is not a stiff structure. This is a very um, delicate, bendable, flexible, maneuverable. It has muscles that control it. It's innervated, it can sense. It's a highly like evolved apparatus. It's pretty amazing. Okay. Is there anything? Oh, okay. How much time do we have left? 10 minutes. 10 minutes, okay. Let's go back over here. A couple others. Okay, so let's go <clears throat> chelicerates now. Ticks, tick mouth parts. So ticks essentially have something that looks like this. These are the chelicerae. And then they have what's called, what's called a hypostome. And it looks, get it right, it looks like this. And guess what these are for? It's for uh, they like suck. Or like they insert in. Like yeah, but what are these for? They're hooks. They hook in. So what does that do functionally? It keeps them from falling off. Yeah. And what's the difference between a tick feeding and a mosquito feeding? It's active and passive. So ticks are active, correct? What does that mean? They have sucking mouth parts. So well, they all kind of like suck. Like everything kind of like sucks up blood. But I would not define like what's the difference in terms of like how fast is it for a mosquito to bite you? They're like done and It's an instant. How, how, how long does it take for you? Days. It's a totally different feeding process. And again, that's, that's encoded into the mouth parts. So if you have a mouth part like this, what does it suggest that you like, you don't want to go anywhere. You are like stuck 
in the face and they literally, so ticks will insert this hooked thing. That's why if you've ever pulled out ticks or looked up like how to pull out ticks, you grab not the body, but the head, you pull them out from the head because if you don't, you'll just rip the head off and the head will keep feeding, which is actually like really cool and really interesting. So you have to pull out ticks from pulling out the head. And typically when you pull out a tick from the head, who's ever done this, what happens? What? Yeah. You get like a chunk of skin. You get a huge chunk of skin. You like, if you pull out a tick, if you pull out a tick, you will not just pull out like the mouth part, you'll get like a huge chunk of skin. The skin will rip off. So that's because for two reasons. One is that it's barbed, so you can't just like pull it out. Like this is this is hard material. You can't just pull it out. The other reason is ticks have uh, what's called cementing proteins. And so now we're starting to get into the evolution of saliva for the function of feeding. Ticks will literally glue their face to your skin. They're, they spit out saliva that like hardens and glues their face to your skin. So that's why when you rip out a tick, you get a huge chunk of skin every time. Um, and it's another indication of if you pulled out a tick and it was very easy to pull out, what would you conclude? It had like just slashed on. It had, never, it had not been there for very long. And that's actually very important for disease because the longer a tick feeds, the more likely you are to get a disease from a tick. It's very correlated with the time that it's been on there. So um, the main point is again, like you can see how organisms feed and how they spread disease by looking at their mouth parts. Uh, and a tick is a good example of that. Mosquito is a good example of that. And I'll do another one that we will talk about in the semester. So we're still in chelicerates. There are mites called trombiculids. Trombiculidae. That's the family, these are called chiggers. They're tiny, they're hard to see. And if you look at um, chiggers, depending on what life, life stage, here's actually kind of confusing. The nymphs have six legs, so they kind of look like insects, and then the adults have eight legs, so it's a little bit weird. Um, but the ones that we care about that spread disease are typically the nymphs. And they have, it's, if you look at the electron micrographs, they have lips that look like this. It's like they have lips and they like, it's essentially like they're like kissing you. And so guess if you looked at their mouth parts, how would you conclude that they feed? They like bite, like, like they chew into you. Do they? But how do you suck up skin? So you're, you're both kind of right, except they don't, they don't actually bite. It's not a bite. They scrape. No, they don't scrape. Again, if you have like soft lips, how would you feed on something? Salt. Do they burst? Yes. What did you say? Dissolve is burst. They spit. So it's almost like a fly. They spit and they spit out sal salivary enzymes. So if this is like your skin. They will spit into your skin that will dissolve your skin tissue into like a nutritious goop that they then suck up. So when chiggers are feeding, they create like a hole in your skin where they're like spitting and sucking and spitting and sucking and spitting and sucking. Um, and it's actually interesting. So guess how you get diseases from these mites? You don't actually get a disease from them feeding. The way that you get a disease is these bites are super itchy because you're getting a whole bunch of like immunogenic like reactions to this and they're there for a while and they're feeding for a while. And then what happens is you scratch it or you slap it. And as soon as you slap it, you smash that all into your open wound, and then the pathogens, if there's pathogens in there, get into your body. And that's how you get diseases from mites. So again, like the way that arthropods feed is often like directly correlated with how they transmit diseases. Um, how much time do I have left? Uh, four minutes. Four minutes. Okay, wait, okay, what's the question? Do these mites ever go under the skin? Scabies go under the skin, not chiggers. So there are medically and veterinarily like important mites called scabies that will like live in your skin, but not, uh, not those ones. 
Okay, couple other, couple other like evolutions that are worth pointing out before we finish. So evolutions that help strategy. So we've talked about evolutions in mouth parts. We've talked about evolutions in saliva. There are also evolutions in claws. This is particularly important for, guess what organism that needs to like hold on to you? Lice. Lice. So in humans, there's kind of three, but more like two species of lice that are associated with us. So there's the pubic lice, and then there's head lice or body lice. These are the same species, but sort of like very closely related subspecies, depending on like what papers you read. The pubic lice are actually a totally different species, which is really interesting because your hairs are different on your head and your pubic area. And so their claws are actually like, if you look at their claws, their claws are like evolved like this so that the distance, the diameter of like the wrap around the claw is perfectly evolved to be, to match the distance of the hairs that are growing in that region. And it's so important that like, yeah, they're not even the same species, like they're totally different. So it's a, again, like the ectoparasites that we have and the things that have feed on us are like highly evolved and specialized to feed off of us. And so what this means in terms of the lice, um, can lice survive off your body? No, and, and the, so pretty much if a, lot, if a louse falls off, like it'll survive for a little while, but it pretty much dies. And so if you look at like evolutionary patterns of lice and their or ectoparasites and the things that they feed on, the, the phylogenetic trees, so if you look at like the evolutionary patterns of the ectoparasites and you compare those to the, the hosts, they match perfectly. So like if you have like gorilla, gorilla, gorilla louse, and if you have like human, human louse, they match perfectly, which means that if you have like, they can only feed on the thing that they are, have evolved to feed on. It's so specialized. Now there is some like, there's some like crossover there are some, like, maybe vet people can help me out. Like, are there situations where you find, like, dog fleas on cats? Or no, not really. I said, what? I said, yes. Yeah, did you say yes? Dog fleas on cats and cat fleas on dogs. Yes. yes. You the will fleas, see that. The fleas can. They can know, kind of cross over. Yeah. yeah. Lice, no. Yeah. Oh, but not for lice. No, lice, no. Like, okay. Lice are highly special, species specific because of that feature. That yes. Okay, so good. So we're <laughs> testimonial. Okay, very good. <laughs> Okay, so that's that's and the thing about fleas is that it can jump, right? So that would that's what fleas are known for. So that would suggest that yes, they can jump. Um, so just keep in mind that typically ectoparasites are like highly evolved to feed on only their host. Um, final thing, then this is the final wrap up. Final evolution is uh, how easy do you think it is to Get uh, get food in the wild. Yeah, it's actually like really difficult. It's easy for us as humans because we've kind of like figured stuff out. But for animals, it's it's very difficult. And so once they find a blood meal, they typically do not want to have to take multiple blood meals. So they try to feed as much as they possibly can and use that that sort of like successful event to milk it for everything it's worth. So most of the most of the arthropods we'll be working with, most of them are, I forget whether it's K or R, but they are high reproduction, so they'll produce like thousands of offspring, hundreds, hundreds, I mean, right, hundreds or thousands of offspring. Ticks can produce like 10,000, 10,000 eggs from uh, an adult feeding event, okay? So there's a high fecundity because the getting a blood meal successfully is a very rare event, and that also means there's this thing called engorgement which is very common, which is they feed and then they will literally become like balloons. So if you look at a tick that's feeding, it'll look like this. And you won't even be, you will not even be able to tell what it is because it literally looks like this. The, the gut, literally, it actually has to synthesize new cuticle, which is the exoskeleton. The gut actually has to make more gut to 
hold the contents of the blood meal. And they literally look like this. They look like balloons that have like sucked in the legs. Like it's, it's crazy. Uh, mosquitoes are the same thing. When a mosquito feeds, if it successfully gets a blood meal, it will look like this. And there are stretch receptors in the gut that when it stretches out, then it knows it has a blood meal and then it starts making eggs. So I guess that's the final point is the reason most of these things feed is to get energy from the blood to produce eggs, which then translates to the high fecundity. Okay, any questions? All right, have a good Friday.